Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to the house of God as we gather together today in worship. There's always a reality going behind what we see. In this room are friends in Christ, but I want to give you a glimpse of what is happening in heaven at this moment to prepare your hearts for worship. So hear the word of God this morning that says, Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands, ten thousands times ten thousand. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. In a loud voice they sang, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain, to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth, every creature, and under the earth and on the sea, and all that is in them singing, to him who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb be praise, honor, glory, and power forever and ever. Then the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. Friends, that is what is happening in heaven at this hour. The angels are worshiping Jesus Christ. Let's stand to our feet and let's join the worship that's already begun.
for bringing us to you to join in your resurrection. Help us to praise you, for you alone are worthy of all of our praise. So, Father, because of Christ's ascension to your right hand, we are a free people and a free people indeed. And this morning, we are alive because of Jesus Christ. May that be the very testimony of every aspect of our lives, that he is alive, and therefore we are alive. And may we bring that message to this world. It's in the precious name of Christ we pray. Amen. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now before you sit down, please remain standing. And we're going to join our minds and we're going to join our hearts with words that have fundamentally changed the world. What we're about to say as one body is the very core of what we believe as a church. And from these words come truth. And from this truth comes how we live our lives and how the world has been changed. So would you joyfully join with me 
as we profess what we believe as people of Christ. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the universal Catholic Church, the communion of believers, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Friends, that is what we believe, and that changes how we live. And that is also what Eric believes, and that is what is going to change how Eric lives. And so I'm going to invite Eric DeWard to come forward at this time. Eric has already met with the pastors and the elders. He believes in God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And he wants to live out this gift of faith in pursuit of Jesus Christ. Eric I am proud of you in advance. Your pastors are, your elders are, Dick Burgess, elder this morning, coming forward to support you as well. The most important question you will ever be asked, the most important question you can ever answer, do you receive Jesus Christ as both your Savior and your Lord? What is your answer? Do you receive and do you depend only upon Jesus Christ, there is no other person and no other way to be forgiven of your sins. Christ and Christ alone. Do you believe that? Thank you. Eric, concerning God's word, we believe it is inspired, it is inerrant, it is infallible. It tells us, it shows us the best way to live our lives. Do you see this as God's best authority and direction for your life. Do you believe that? That's what you believe on the inside, and that is a wonderful gift of faith from God. But if you believe that on the inside, it's going to impact, it's going to affect, and it's going to change how you live. So I'm going to ask you this lengthy question that we went through in the elders meeting. But hear these words again. Do you promise to make faithful use of the means of grace, especially the hearing of the word and the use of the sacraments, that's baptism and communion. Will you give faithful adherence to the doctrines and teaching of the church, teaching from God's word alone? Will you walk in a spirit of Christian fellowship and brotherly and sisterly love with the congregation? Will you submit yourself to all loving Christian discipline? Will you offer faithfully to the service of God your prayers, your talents, and your gifts? And will you seek the things that make for purity and peace, both in your life and in the life and ministry of God's church? Eric, again, you can't do any of that on your own. But with the power of God's Holy Spirit active and alive in you, will you seek to do these things? Thank you. We're going to come alongside of you and join together in a circle of prayer. Congregation, join with us. Father, this is your day. And Father God, this is a good day. And we choose to rejoice and be glad in it. For we have a brand new brother in the faith. Thank you for Eric. Thank you that all those years ago, his mom and his dad stood and announced that he was a gift received from you. He was identified to the waters of baptism and people promised to raise him to know Jesus as his Lord and Savior. Father, this morning he stands and says, indeed, Jesus is mine and I am his. Thank you that this life is marked. It is identified. It belongs to you and you alone. And Father, I pray that you will strengthen our brother, that he will always run to you, and he will always lean into your everlasting arms. Thank you for this gift of faith. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. 
a certificate to help remember God's promises today. And would you celebrate and thank God for what he has done in Eric's life. Back following our worship this morning, please seek him out, encourage him, and connect that name and face together. Thank you. So we have a reason to rejoice. We have a reason to be in prayer before God. As always, the yellow inserts are in your worship bulletin. Pull those out. Let those guide your prayers and the way that you care for folks a part of this fellowship. Let's turn our minds and hearts to prayer. But before we go, one thing to encourage us. First service, Steve Jurgens was with us, and he had an update on the status of the tumor in his brain Many tests, many years, doctors reported back to him recently that the tumor is stable and is not growing. So we praise God for that report. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that we can come before your throne of grace this morning. And that's what it is to us who are in Christ. Nothing but your grace and your mercy and your love. And so we joyfully come before you today. Father, we want to lift up to you those that are suffering today, specifically in Nepal. We think of the earthquake that has devastated that region. 1,800 souls, people created in your image, gone. Never to be heard from again. And so, Father, we pray that the church global, as she reaches out, that she ministers and cares for these people, would bring temporal and tangible relief would meet the immediate needs of those who are suffering in light of this earthquake. And at the very same time, Father, as we meet those temporal needs, we would come alongside and meet the eternal needs, that we would bring the only true satisfaction that is ultimately found in your Son, Jesus Christ. And so, Father, we pray for your church that she would rise up and meet this need on the world stage. Father, for those in our fellowship who have asked for prayer, we bring them before you today. For Ann Root, thank you for a successful surgery. For Marlene Goff, that things are going much better at this time. For Vicki Zanser, as she continues to recover at home. Father, going through more than most of us will ever experience. Father, thank you for the increased strength. We pray that you could return our sister to us here at this church. For Deb Carson, Virginia Gessner, Susan Raglan, all positive reports and progress going forward. And Father, for our brother Dave Hinkle, in a hospital room this morning, continuing to wait on the surgery for his arteries. Father, what a delicate and detailed process. Would you give him the power and presence of your Holy Spirit in his life? And even in this, Father, might he testify to the goodness of knowing Jesus. Father, we thank you for the way you are sending folks out in mission through this church, blessing Hudsonville, neighborhoods, and the world. Father, as we continue in worship gathered from the preaching of the word through Pastor Sean this morning, thank you that he is not relying on himself, but that he has been prayer, that he trusts and points to the work of the Holy Spirit, and that his one sole job here will be to make much of Jesus Christ. Thank you for his commitment to that end. Father, as we give as a church, might we be generous. Might we respond to the generosity you have given to us first so that the advancement of the gospel might go out from this place, that people might know repentance and forgiveness and restoration in Jesus Christ. Father, continue to do that work in our lives wherever you call us to this week. Might we be people who display repentance and faith might we be quick to show where the old man or woman has died and where the new man or woman is rising to life in Jesus Christ. Might we be a visible representation of the humility, love, and compassion of Jesus Christ as we share his truth. It's in the power of his name we pray. Amen. Friends, we continue in worship as the deacons come forward for a morning offering. Again, a time for us to be generous and be thankful for what God has done. And as always, the fellowship pads are before you. Flip that open, sign your name, pass it back and forth so we can know who's worshiping with us.
Because everything I've lost, I have found in you. When I finally reach the end, I'll say, you are worth it all. There's no riches or earthly treasure that will satisfy. Sarah, Joash, thank you. He is worthy to receive all of our praise forevermore. Amen? Amen. And so we join in with the reality of heaven already. And we make our way in God's word to the book of Philippians. I invite you to go there with me. Philippians chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. We are in our third of a five-week study in the book of Philippians. And you'll find the second chapter begins on page 1,827, 1827 this morning. And with his word open before us, together let's pray once more. Heavenly Father, that we would be invited to join in singing, Worthy is the Lamb, always worthy, 
worthy today, worthy forevermore to receive all glory and honor and praise. Father, thank you for the truth that we may sing about it, that we may pray about it, that we may read and study it, and through the power of your Holy Spirit, have it transform our very lives. Would you please continue to do that even here and especially this morning? For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Wrestling was a requirement. Not necessarily wrestling, but the physical education class was the requirement in junior high. And along with that PE instruction was the wrestling rotation. We had to learn about, we had to participate in, we had to grapple and and wrestle another person on the mat. Of course, you know. You already know how I loathe PE. You know how I loathe exercise. You know how athletically I live in a challenged body. But there was no way to avoid it. I had to participate in wrestling. Mr. Reinsberger was our instructor. He was our teacher. He had us all line up in the gymnasium, and then perhaps by height and weight, he went through and paired us off. And then sitting in those pairs on the mats, we watched as our peers wrestled. We watched as they tried to pin the other person. Of course, watching all of this did nothing except cause me to sweat profusely and nervously. In that moment, I would have rather been taking an algebra test or perhaps listening to Mr. Vendenen drone on in science class. But neither of those were an option at this point in time. Very soon, I would have to try to pin another person with a full Nelson or a half Nelson. I'd even try a three-quarter Nelson if there was such a thing. And then finally, it was my turn. And so walking out onto the mat and standing across from the other individual, we assumed a wrestling stance. I will not show that to you now. But we assumed a wrestling stance standing across from one another. Mr. Reinsberger gave a short whistle, and it was done. The whole match was over in the brevity of about six seconds. And I would like to tell you all about it. I would like to tell you exactly what happened, but I was on the mat, and I was on my back, and I was pinned too quickly. I don't know how it went down. All I know is I was down. And I remember the sound. I remember the sound of all of my peers. I remember the sound of my friends laughing laughing at me as I lay on my back, laughing at me as I stood up and walked back to the wall. I was humiliated. Junior high, sixth grade especially, is hard enough. But being humiliated in front of all of your friends, being embarrassed and having to sit there and listen to it all for another half an hour. That was hard. Humble pie can cause horrible indigestion. Being humiliated is horrible when you are in sixth grade. But being humiliated as an adult is no better. Being humiliated, being embarrassed, being mocked, being ridiculed, being laughed at, it's hard to let that go. 
it's hard to forget that moment. And so many of us have made a decision. Many of us have decided, I I will never be humiliated again. I I will not be embarrassed again. I am not going to put myself in a situation where where I have to clothe myself in humility, where I have to be meek. I I am not going to do it. I don't want anything to do with it. No one will humiliate me again. And so we have many people who have turned their back entirely on the idea of humility. We have many people who want nothing to do with a humble spirit. They believe there's nothing good with it. And of course, there is our friend, the Apostle Paul. And Paul is in the process of writing us a letter. Paul is in the process of sharing a letter with the Christians in Philippi. And Paul is explaining how we can live a joy-filled life in the midst uh, of a variety of situations and experiences. Paul wants us to know that there is joy in the Christian life. Amen? And yet Paul says there is joy in humility. Paul says there there can be joy in humility. But many of us miss it because we want nothing to do with such a disposition. Consider what can happen when you choose joy. When you choose joy a humble spirit. Paul is inspired by God to write these words. Listen in to his letter. This is the word of God. If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in what? Humility. But in humility, consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interest, but also to the interest of others. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross." Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Please keep God's word open to that portion of Scripture. At some point in time, you were humiliated. At some point in time, someone embarrassed you. At some point in time, someone brought you to the midst of tears and you wanted to run. You wanted to hide. And remembering that person, remembering that experience, remembering that moment, you have convinced yourself you will never go there again. And not only are you trying to insulate and protect yourself from being humiliated, but you've made a decision that you will not choose such humility and you will not choose such a humble disposition on your own. But God has a better plan and God has a better way. There is joy in living a life of humility. There is joy in living a life of humility when it's done in the name of Christ. 
But too often, something gets in the way. What gets in the way of living a life of humility in the name of Jesus Christ? What, first of all, gets in the way is something called ambition. Say that with me. Ambition. Ambition. Selfish ambition can get in the way of living a humble life. Jump right back in at verse 3 with me and see what Paul writes. He says, do nothing out of selfish what? Ambition. Do nothing out of selfish ambition. Now, we're not talking a little bit of ambition. We're not talking a little bit of drive. We're not talking a little bit of motivation. We are talking about a person who says, I am motivated, I am ambitious, and I am going after that. And I'm going to get that. If you get in the way, if something gets in the way, if a series of events get in the way, I don't care. You're not going to stop me because I want that. I am going to get that. It is a selfish, self-centered ambition. Now, Paul uses a certain word here to, to describe this selfish ambition, arithio. And it's actually a political term. Yes, already when Paul was inspired to write, there were politics and politicians, and already there was political language. And for his letter to those in Philippi, Paul chose a political term. It's the picture of a politician who loves being a politician. It's a picture of a politician who says, that's the office that I want. That's the seat, that's the desk, that's the responsibility. Those are the perks and those are the privileges that I want. And I'm going to get them. And not only am I going to get them, but I'm going to keep them. And I don't care what I have to do to keep them in my possession. I want it and I will get it. It's a selfish self-serving ambition. And that ambition lives right here in the heart. Satan had such a self-serving ambition, and the prophet Isaiah was inspired to write about it in Isaiah 14. Listen to this. Listen to the activity of Satan. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the mount of assembly on the utmost heights of the sacred mountain. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. This is the selfish ambition. This is the selfish heart of Satan. What does he say five times in that passage? He says what? I will. Say it with me. I will. That is the selfish ambition of Satan. It is the heart that beats within him. He knows what he wants, and he will do whatever he can, as long as he can, to try to achieve it and hang on to it. Now, that's Satan, but go all the way back in Genesis. And all the way back in Genesis at the third chapter... You see Adam and Eve, and you see their heart beat with ambition when a certain fruit is set before them. God has told them, don't eat of that fruit. That fruit is mine. Don't eat of that fruit. You can eat of all the other fruit, but don't touch that. That's mine. And yet Arithio selfish ambition. The selfish motivation of their hearts beat so strongly that they took and they ate that they could be like God. Many times in our lives you see such selfish ambition. You see such selfish motivation playing out in the area of work, employment, a career, a job. You see, God provides for us an opportunity to work hard and to work well that we can have the means to provide for our families. 
And yet too often, the heart beats selfishly. Too often, the heart has an ambition that says, I want more. I'm not satisfied with this job. I am not satisfied with this position. I am not satisfied being here. I am not satisfied with these hours. I am not satisfied with this pay. I want more. And I'm going to get more. I will do whatever I have to do to get that position. I will do whatever I have to do to climb that ladder. I will do whatever I have to do to achieve that pay scale. I will do whatever I have to do, and they will have to look up to me. They will have to respect me. They will have to call me ma'am or sir. I am going to get what I want. I'm going to get that job. And if I have to lie, if I have to cheat, if I have to steal, if I have to forge, I will do what I have to do. And you see, there's no room there for humility. There is no humble disposition. And I'll tell you, you see such a life chasing after that brass ring of employment and a certain job. And I will show you people who have spent an entire life trying to achieve something. And it leaves them empty. And it leaves them dissatisfied. And they still lack joy. It's hard to have a humble disposition when the heart is so selfishly ambitious. It's also hard to have a humble disposition when the head, when the mind is filled with, secondly, arrogance. Say that with me. Arrogance. There's no room for humility when the head is filled with arrogance. Back into verse 3, you see Paul writing. He says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Whereas such selfish ambition lives in the heart, vain conceit and arrogance takes up residency in the head. It's the idea that you are always right. Isn't it wonderful to always be right? Isn't it wonderful to know that everything that comes out of your mouth is true? Isn't it wonderful to know that, that no one should ever question what you say because you are always right? There are some folks who have such an arrogant mind. It's that idea of, of vain conceit. And as Paul is explaining it here, he uses a word, kenodoxia. You'll recognize doxia. It sounds like doxology. When we sing and when we bring all praise and glory to God. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. That's the doxology. It's filled with praise and glory for God. But Paul says here, no, no, no. He says, too many of you are filled with vain conceit. Too many of you have minds that, that are filled with arrogance, that are filled with kenodoxia. It means empty glory. He says, you are filled with empty glory. He says, you glory in yourself. You think you're right all the time. You, you are so arrogant. Do you know anyone like that? Or has that ever been you? You're convinced that you are always right. My mother disciplined me often as a child. She disciplined me often as my dad was usually gone working. And it was in one of these moments of receiving discipline that she continued to instruct me. She was continuing to tell me what was right, and yet I continued to interrupt her in a repeated way. Oh, poor mother, if only you could listen to the vastness of my knowledge as a 10-year-old boy. Oh, poor ignorant woman you are. No, I didn't say that out loud. No, 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 but, but, but perhaps I was thinking it. 
Because as she was disciplining me, as she was instructing me, I arrogantly interrupted. Until it came to that moment when, when her little bony finger pointed right at me and said, Sean Michael, not one more peep. And I looked right at her. Peep. <laughs> no, that's not funny because you weren't there and you don't know uh, what followed. There were no more peeps that afternoon. There were no more peeps that evening. Some of us have an arrogant head. We have an arrogant mind. We think that we are never wrong, and we believe if people would just be quiet and listen to us, then everything would be better. You see, a lot of times this, this arrogant mind, this arrogant head, sneaks into marriage. And you can have a man and a woman who have promised in marriage. And yet you can have one of them who believes they are always right. You can have one of them who believes they are never wrong. You can have one of them who is, is arrogantly convinced that they never have to apologize. They never have to say, I'm sorry. They never have to listen to the other. They begin to believe that if their spouse would, would just be quiet, if their spouse would just listen, if their spouse would just see everything exactly the way they do, everything would be fine. It is an arrogant mind. It is a vain conceitedness. It is almost narcissistic. And it's hurting many of our marriages. It's hurting many of our most important relationships. And you see, there's no room there for humility. There is no humble disposition. And you look at a marriage that might call itself Christian, but with no humility, there is no real joy. Selfish ambition takes up residency in the heart, and it wants, and it's going to do everything it can to get what it wants. Arrogance takes up residency within the head, within the mind, believes that you are always right, you are never wrong, people should see everything the way you do. And then finally, one of the things that stops us from a humble disposition is, is what we will call, number three, an autonomous agenda. Say that with me. An autonomous agenda. What does that mean? It means you're only going to serve yourself. An autonomous agenda means that when it comes to your hands, Everything you do in life from this point forward is going to be you first, you most. An autonomous agenda says, don't expect me to walk alongside of you. Don't expect me to make a way before you. Don't expect me to, to protect you from behind. No, because I'm not worried about you. I am taking care of me. I have an autonomous agenda. I am taking care of me. I'm doing what I want. I'm living my life. You can take care of yourself. Don't ask me to help. I don't care about you. It sounds harsh because it is. Paul addresses such an autonomous agenda in verse 4. Look down one more time, please. He says, you should look 
not only to your own interests, but also to the interest of others. You see that person with such an autonomous agenda, they don't care about the other person. They don't care about other people. They believe it really is their time. They believe it really is their treasure. They believe it really is their talent, and they're going to use it for themselves. It's mine. I'm not giving you any. Get your own. Have you ever gone into a restaurant and you see a family come walking in? And as a family is, is seated at the table and as food is brought to the table, how does that meal unfold? You know, sometimes you look and you will see uh, one of the spouses uh, quickly moving to the plates of, of the children, and they're making sure that the children have napkins and that the food is, is cut up properly and that the children have, have a drink and that the, the baby is, is being fed. And, and this, this particular parent is, is taking care of all the children first before they take a single bite. And yet the other parent no sooner receives their food from the wait staff and they immediately dig in without any thought towards the others. Shame on me. Shame on me. How often we just expect other people to take care of themselves. And we expect it because we're not going to help. We have an autonomous agenda. I'm just going to take care of me. I don't care about you. I'm not thinking about you. I'm not worried about you. If you need something, get it yourself. And there's no room there for humility. There's no room there for a humble disposition. There's no joy. So how do I find the joy? Friends, joy follows the humble choice. Joy follows the humble choice to be like Christ because Christ did not keep his heart, his head, and his hands for himself, but he used his heart his head, and his hands to bless others. And there was joy. One more time at verse 5. Listen. What does it look like to choose humility? Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross." Instead of being selfishly ambitious, instead of being arrogantly self-serving, instead of having this autonomous agenda, 
What might it look like if we choose humility? What might it look like if we choose to be like Christ? I want to give you three brief thoughts to take home. I'm going to encourage you to pick one of these for this week. Just pick just one. You're going to make a decision. You're going to choose humility. You're going to choose a humble disposition by working on one of these. First of all, Christ, even though he's equal to God, even though he is very God of very God, very man of very man, Jesus still chose to make himself nothing. Here's the first option for this week. In choosing humility, talk less about yourself and talk more about your heavenly Father. Talk less about yourself. We talk a lot about us. We tell people who we are. We tell people what we do. We tell people where we've been. We tell people what we're working on. We tell people what we're anticipating doing. We talk and we talk and we talk about ourselves. Maybe because we think we're so important. How often do we talk about our Heavenly Father? How often do we praise Him? How often do we sing that doxology to Him throughout the course of the week? God, praise you from whom all blessings flow. You see, if you choose humility, it means you're going to talk a whole lot more about God and a whole lot less about yourself. Or maybe you want to see how, how God had Jesus to make himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant. Maybe this week you're going to choose humility by making yourself more like a servant. Instead of seeing what people can do for you, instead of living a life that is strictly focused on yourself and getting and amassing for yourself, you're going to find a way to serve and to bless somebody else. What can you do for somebody else? How can you bless somebody else? How can you surprise them by simply showing up and accomplishing one of their greatest needs? What would that look like? Being a servant. Or finally, one more. You see Jesus humbling himself, and he became obedient to death, verse 8, even death on a cross. Maybe you're going to choose humility by recognizing how Jesus did the will of his Father in heaven. And maybe for a long time you've been wrestling with God's will. Maybe for a long time you have been wrestling with God's word and you have not wanted to do it because it's gotten in the way of your life. It's gotten in the way of what you want to do. It's gotten in the way of what makes you happy. And so you've been avoiding this. But Jesus made himself obedient. He humbled himself to the point of death, even death upon a cross, he humbled himself and did the will of his Father in heaven. What have you been telling God no to? You've been hanging on to it. And you've refused to humble yourself. You've refused to surrender. That this week, you may choose with humility to pursue him entirely in it. I never wrestled again, except with my sons. And they're almost starting to win. When you're humiliated and embarrassed, it's hard to go back there. But when you choose a humble disposition and when you choose to follow the example of Jesus Christ, there is joy. There is joy 
in giving him your heart and your head and your hands in faithful service. Praise him with me. Heavenly Father, we praise you from whom all blessings flow. Father, we praise you this morning that we need not be selfish, that we need not be self-centered, that we need not worry about the details in our lives. Father, we need to surrender. We need to humble ourselves. And like those elders in glory, we need to fall down on our faces, giving you our best and giving you our all. Father, humble your children and teach us how to serve you with greater joy. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're able to stand for God's parting blessing, would you please do so? An opportunity to serve him, an opportunity to serve him humbly, an opportunity to serve him well. But that means dying uh, from that old self and rising again in the new, even as Eric confessed and believed this morning, that life is ours to live and we will find joy in it. And as you go forth, may you always know the love of God our Father, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, and the amazing grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, as all God's people say, amen. We sing of this cornerstone.
Oh, Lord. 